Okay, good luck, everybody. Um, Machaim, Machaim, Racha. Um, I'm actually not in uh, LA today, and I wasn't sure if I should really do the program tonight. It was a little bit later than, uh, than usual, but I saw something today from the Rebbe, which uh, inspired me to not only to do the program as usual, but to make it extra special, because the Rebbe said that this year, on the 17th of Tammuz, falls out on Shabbos, there's a special uh, energy it says in the Talmud that when the fast of, of Tammuz is pushed off for a day, it's a special segula that it should be pushed off completely and we shouldn't have to fast at all. So this year, when, when the 17th of Tammuz and 9th of Av are both on Shabbos, so there's a special blessing this year in general for the uh, fast to be completely dismissed and, and removed from us. And become a day of joy and happiness. But the Rebbe said that the day itself of Shabbos, when the fast day uh, should have been a fast day if it was during the week, um, the fact that we don't fast could be explained in two possible ways. One way is it's a happy day, it's Shabbos, you shouldn't have morning, we push it off a day. That's one way of explaining it. The deeper way of explaining it is, is that since the whole purpose of the calamities of the 17th of Tammuz were in order to prepare for the coming of Mashiach, the purpose of the exile and the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash in the first place is for Geula, for redemption. So it comes out that the 17th of Tammuz is actually a good thing. That's why 17 is the numerical equivalent to the word Toy, which means good. And when it falls on on Shabbos, so there's a revelation of the inner meaning of the day. So it's not like we're celebrating Shabbos and we can't, we can't focus on the 17th of Tammuz. It's more like when the 17th of Tammuz falls out on Shabbos, so then we connect with the inner meaning of the 17th of Tammuz, the goodness of the day. And in general, the closer we get to the coming of Mashiach, and all the signs of the Torah point to our time being time of Mashiach, the less of a feeling of, of the of mourning of the past there is, and there's more a sense of preparation and anticipation for the coming of Mashiach. That's why the celebration of the 12th of Tammuz, which was celebrated earlier this week, uh, ordinarily the, the, the month of Tammuz is a month when all these calamities happened, and it's not a time known for celebration, but in our generation, we have the day of the 12th and 13th of Tammuz, that liberation of previous Rebbe, and the reason why uh, these celebrations are happening this month is because as you approach the coming of Mashiach, when some of the Tammuz will come a young to come a holiday, so there's already a sense of joy and happiness in this month already because of because of the um, uh, because the Mashiach will come will be revealed the purpose of the exiles is for the coming of Mashiach, so therefore as you approach the coming of Mashiach and get closer to any moment for the Mashiach to come. So already now, there's not such a strong sense of mourning as it was in previous times. Instead, there's more of a sense of what will happen, how Mashiach will come. And that's why the focus of learning about Mashiach, uh, learning about Mashiach um, isn't, we're supposed to say in the Talmud that you're supposed to learn about the, the uh, building base of Megdash, even at the time of its destruction. But ordinarily, when you learn about the Beis HaMikdash during these three weeks, it's with a sense of like, okay, we have this time of mourning for the destruction and we need to counter that, we need to have an antidote for it. But now, as we approach the coming Mashiach, it's more of a sense of, let's learn the laws of the times. Mashiach is going to come. Where should the Mizbeach, where should the altar be? Where should the menorah be? Where should the table be? So it's, it's, it's a whole different kind of feeling um, uh, with these, um, these three weeks. So on that note, the, the, the positive energy that the Rebbe gives us to, to, with this perspective of understanding where we are in history and what these three weeks are and what the focus should be um, is very connected to the 
the stories that I want to share with you. I want to share with you two stories. The first story I heard today from uh, the man uh, who was involved in the story, Mr. Moshe Battalion. Um, his um, his uh, father was very ill with cancer, and his sister was um, uh, about to get married, and he wanted to get a bracha from the Rebbe. His father um, needed a bracha for a full shlema. So his sister visited the Rebbe for private audience and hoping that the Rebbe would bless her father to get better. So before she went to the Rebbe, what actually happened was she went to the hospital. And the hospital, the, she told the doctors how she's going to get married. And, and the doctor said to her, you should make your wedding. Your wedding should be in the hospital because your father is not going to leave the hospital. Why? Because he can't leave the hospital. It's impossible to leave the hospital. There's no way in the, in the realm of nature for your father to recover. And therefore, you should get married as soon as possible and, as fa- and, and in the hospital, because if you want your father to attend, he's not leaving. So she went to her father, and her father said, please go to the Rebbe. And the man my nomin asked the Rebbe to say my name. And for a foolish time, asked him to say my name. Okay? That's what her father told her. She came to the Rebbe, and she gave her name, uh, she gave her father's name to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe uh, read her kvittel, read her note, and her father told her, make sure that the Rebbe says his name. He wants the Rebbe to actually say his name for a full shlem that he should have a complete and speedy recovery. So after the Rebbe note, read her note, she told the Rebbe she wants the Rebbe to say her father's name. So the Rebbe said, I, I read your note, but she repeated said, no, I want the Rebbe should say my father's name. And the Rebbe said, I've done that. So she says a third time, and she's there in the room with her uh, future husband and with the um, Rebbe Groner, and she says, I am not leaving this room until the Rebbe will say my father's name for a full Kreva Shlema. So she said, so Rabbi Groner didn't know what to do with himself and neither did her future husband. But the Rebbe gave her a, a, a beautiful smile and never said her father's name and her, and her father's mother's name. And then the Rebbe said that um, you'll have her for Shlema. And the Rebbe also said that the wedding will be very joyous and big. I don't know if the Rebbe said big, but it'll be very joyous. And then the Rebbe said that your father will have nachas. So sure enough, miraculously, um, she was she attended. Uh, her father was able to leave the hospital. Her father was able to come to the wedding and celebrate the wedding. And uh, and she she married to, to have a child the year after her marriage. And her father was able to hold the baby. And the Rebbe's blessing, your father will see nachas, was fulfilled. So this man, her Meisha Battalion, his conclusion from the story was he said. It wasn't just that the Rebbe's blessing was fulfilled. It was also that their father got chayas, he got power, he got energy from the Rebbe's words. The Rebbe's words gave their father power and energy. So he said, when the Rebbe says something, as git koiches, when the Rebbe says something, the Rebbe, a word, the Rebbe says a word, it gives energy. Because they're not just the Rebbe's words of a tzaddik are accepted by Hashem, but also when a human being, a regular person, not a tzaddik, Listen to Rebbe's words with faith. It just inspires and gives energy and 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 and, and charges you with 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 a different kind of you make with, with spring in your step. My grandmother Zangazunt, uh, Rebbe Sin Fogelman, was once uh, talking at a gathering in front of Rebbe Sinchana. Rebbe's, Rebbe's mother was there, and my grandmother mentioned how it says in Sefer Yashar or Rabbeinu Tam, the words that come from the heart enter the heart. And so she said that the Ramam says that a Jewish leader is called the heart of the Jewish people. So words that come from the heart of the Jewish people from the Rebbe enter the heart of every Jew and strikes a chord in the heart of every Jew. That's what she said. Rebbe Simchana loved it. Rebbe Simchana said, you spoke like an older chassid. This is an inborn trait you have. 
But that's the fact. The Rebbe's words give strength and, and energy because of where they come from, because the emiss of them, because the truth of them, because the godliness in them. That's a good intro to the next story I want to share. Uh, this story was written by uh, Rev. Ari Smith and printed in Kvar Chaban magazine, in Gimel Kama's issue. And the story is about a Rabbi Eliezer Lane, who worked in the Beis Ritka schools in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he came to Rebbe first in 1968. And as customary in Chabad, uh, the boys from Eretz Yisrael, uh, they're after they graduate high school and the, the first section of Beis Medrash, of uh, post high school learning, they then go to, um, they then go to uh, the Rebbe to study in 770 for a full year. That's how the Rebbe arranged this with the government of Israel for a full year of learning. From the 18th of El to the next 18th of El. So anyways, Rabbi Elias Lane attended this program and he continued on his studies in, 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 in New York. And it was 1968. It was before Rosh Hashanah. It was the 27th of El. And ordinarily our custom is that we read, we do slichas at night time on the first on Saturday night. It's our first time we do slichas, and uh, we do it one o'clock in the morning. The other slichas we do in early morning. However, technically, the time for slichas is bashmeres The Time for slichas is any early time. It doesn't have to be specifically be in the morning. It could also be late at night, like three or four in the morning. And Rabbi Zalman Khanan, who worked in and works in publishing the Rebbe's talks, he had delivered a letter to the Rebbe's secretary for the Rebbe about his work. And he called over his friend, Eliezer. He said, Eliezer, I want to tell you something. I saw, I happened to see when I was in the Rebbe, the Rebbe's secretariat, a, a list of all those who are going to speak to the Rebbe tonight. And I can tell, based on his experience and how the Rebbe's audiences would work and how the amount of people on the list, that it's, it seems like, he said, that the Rebbe is going to do slichas after he concludes his last audience tonight. Instead of doing it in the morning at 7.30 or 7 or 6.30 or in the more early morning, as soon as the Rebbe finishes his, the audience, he's going to, to have a minion, whoever is in 770, to do slichas privately. So I advise you, Eliezer, why don't you stay? And Eliezer said about himself that uh, there are a lot of boys who were night owls. And they would stay up all night and just hang around and talk. He wasn't like that. But hearing this, the Rebbe's going to do slichas that night. He wanted to be part of it. So he stayed up that night. And sure enough, Rabbi Chalakov, the Rebbe's secretary, came out to the, uh, the upstairs in 770, the upstairs study hall, checking to see if there's a minion. And he, as ever, every night, when he, after the Rebbe finished, all the audiences that he had, Rabbi Chalakov would go in and talk to Rabbi for a few minutes at the conclusion of all these audiences. And this time, Rabbi Chalakov went into, asked, went into the study hall to check out there was a minion, and he came back with holding his slichas, and everyone, everyone knew Rabbi was going to come out. Rabbi indeed comes out at 2.15 in the morning, 1968, 27th of L. And Rabbi asks Rabbi Chalakov, can you get another person for the minion? So Rechadakov looks around, he counts other people in the room, and he sees there is a minion in the room. There were eight boys, together with the Rebbe and Rebbe Chadakov, there's 10. So he told the Rebbe, there are 10 people here. The Rebbe asked, can another person uh, come for the minion? Can you get another, one more person? Okay, something's going on. So there were some boys that uh, had, had uh, gone to sleep that night in the uh, another section of 770. Some boys uh, wanted to make sure they got up in the morning for um, the eight o'clock Hasidus class uh, that the Rebbe instituted. Uh, in previous times in Lubavitch, there was no um, Friday morning class because the boys would stay up for Thursday, on Thursday night till very late at night. So. Friday morning, there was no official class, but the Rebbe instituted that their class should be as usual, just a half hour later. Eight o'clock in the morning is the Hasidus time, so some boys wanted to make sure they were there and they slept in, in, in 770. 
So they found this guy who was sleeping there. They woke him up. The Rebbe was waiting to come. He washed, they gave him Negevah, so he runs over, and he um, joined the minion. As soon as he comes in, the Rebbe, they began, they began slichas. They didn't know what it meant. They didn't know why they needed more people. They didn't know what, at all what was going on. A few months later, it was the second night of Hanukkah. Rabbi Eliezer Lane is in 770, and he hears a commotion. And he keeps on hearing in the, in the commotion, well, there's a, there's a conversation. Everyone's talking about something. And everyone's saying, an Erez Avek. Erez Avek is, the word Avek in Yiddish means he has gone. But it's usually a term used for someone who has passed away. So Rabbi Lane went over to Rabbi Hanan, who was also a student at the time. He said, Erez Avek, who passed away? Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi um, Hanan said, remember the boy with a uh, long blonde beard uh, who studied here? He said, yes, oh my God, did he pass away? He said, no, 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 he didn't pass away. What happened was, was that there was a family that this boy was interested in meeting a girl from a certain family. And the family asked the Rabbi if this is a, something they should consider. And the Rebbe said that they should consult with Rabbi Jacobson. Rabbi Jacobson was sort of the president, the Yoshev Roish of Chabad in America. And he also had started a yeshiva for Bali Tshuva. The first, Bali, the first yeshiva for returnees to their Jewish roots in America is Hadara Terah in Brooklyn. And Rabbi Jacobson began that yeshiva. So the Rebbe said they should, if they're considering this guy as, as, as a, uh, a suitable match their daughter, they, the Rebbe's not going to answer them, but the Rebbe said that they should ask Rabbi Jacobson. This guy, it's in Rabbi Jacobson. So the parents already felt there's something wrong with this boy. Why they have to ask Rabbi Jacobson? They're going to cancel the, the idea, but the Rebbe instructed them to speak to Rabbi Jacobson, so they did. Rabbi Jacobson uh, calls over the boy. He realizes there's something going on. And the boy tells his, Rabbi Jacobson his story. Uh, Rabbi Jacobson didn't, didn't know this boy particularly well. He's actually surprised that ever told him to speak to him. But anyways, he sat down and spoke to him. And the boy's story sounded really good. He had lived in this town in the Midwest. And he had come to be interested in his parents. His parents are Jewish. And he had become interested in Judaism. And that's why he came to this yeshiva. And he's excited about it. And he likes learning. And he's keeping... Um, he's very interested in, in all of the uh, things that he's doing. He must have been a really, really top student if he was interested in even staying till two o'clock in the morning just to be with the Rebbe that night to do the slichas, that special prayer before Shosh Hashanah. Anyway, so Rabbi Jacobson is satisfied with the interview, but he's not satisfied to uh, say that he has understood what the Rebbe is talking about. So he calls up the boy's parents. The boy's parents uh, agree immediately to drive over and they they come to Rabbi Jacobson. I don't know where they were living at that time, but at wherever they were living at, the, at that time, they drove over from where they were, and he arrived in 770 that day, and Rabbi Jacobson met them together with his son. So Rabbi Jacobson said, listen, I don't know what the story really is, but I do know is that the Rebbe Zavart, the Rebbe says something, it, it's, it's not to be ignored. There's something here the Rebbe is asking me to find out. And I'm asking you to please be transparent with me about your son. This is pertinent for your son and for his future. And I need you to be open with me. Tell me what's really going on. So the, uh, the mother is told the boy he needs to leave the room. He leaves the room. The mother says to Jacobson that they wanted to have children for many years. They couldn't have children. So their son, who was always their son, was actually adopted. So I don't know if uh, if anyone would um, advise uh, Jacobson, any, any psychologist would advise Jacobson to do what he did, but by divine providence, uh, Rebbe asked him specifically to take care of the situation. So apparently what he had done was the right thing for that particular story. Um, he calls the boy back in. He says to the boy, the boy never knew he was adopted. He tells him that you're adopted and you're not Jewish. So when the boy discovered he wasn't Jewish, 
he took off his hat, took off his jacket, and he's ran away. And no one heard from him again since. So uh, there, there obviously was something else going on in his life besides um, his uh, his biological Jewishness or not, or real Jewishness. Not obviously something else was going on in his life. But in fact, they rejected everything completely and totally, immediately discovering that he's not Jewish. But it says in Tanya that when there are 10 Jews together praying, even if an angel would be there, the angel will be disintegrated by the holiness of, this, of, of the 10, of the, of the Shekhinah, of the divine presence that rests when there, are, when there are 10 Jews there. So apparently, in ways that we can't possibly know, so the Rebbe, um, the Rebbe didn't, uh, wasn't able, he knew the, the Shechina wasn't there, or however else the Rebbe knew it, and therefore they said they should fall, get someone else for, for the minion. So that's the story I wanted to share tonight, and the bottom line is, is that when we learn things from the Rebbe, whether it's a, a talk of the Rebbe, or it's a discourse, or it's a letter, the Rebbe's words are git koiches, they give us energy, and they give us direction, they give us life, and uh, Hashem should help, we should see the fulfillment of the Rebbe's words, how we are on the threshold of Geula, the threshold of coming Mashiach, and Hashem also help us, we should see this tonight, and automatically tomorrow morning will be transformed to day of celebration and happiness forever. L'chaim, l'chaim, agutavach, Lach Yuda, Lach Lach David, Lach Shui, Lach David, Lach Levi, Lach. All right. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Okay,